Yeah. No, that's okay. Uh, so I'm just gonna have a Hi, everyone. Yeah, so my name is Cameron Townsend. I work for Stone Titans. We uh, created actually of Maven. So our founders built Maven. So who here has heard of Maven? Is everyone? Oh, <laughs> 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 no, good. good. Okay. What, wasn't sure, wasn't sure. I do have a slide on Maven. So if you want to skip that, I'm happy to skip it. I can show you some things about Maven. But if we all know Maven, then that's good. And when uh, the guys who built Maven, so that's Jason Van Zyl and, and, and Brian Fox are our founders, they are two of the first committers into the Maven project. They actually uh, uh, did that as an Apache project to try and sort of smooth that some of the bumps in, in Ant, because Ant was being used at the time and it was a bit fiddly to do build, and Maven used it a convention over configuration architecture. It's really become very popular, I guess, and as a way of building Java projects, it's pretty ubiquitous. So anywhere I go in Asia, I'm a solution architect for Asia Pacific, so uh, I was in Taiwan last week, then Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Singapore, I've even been to Korea. Uh, everyone's using open source, everyone's using Maven, uh, and obviously NPM's becoming popular, uh, Docker's becoming popular. This sort of idea of using open source libraries is actually taking over the world. And a lot of organisations using open source, even banks in Australia and the federal government here are using open source. Whereas five to ten years ago, you might have heard companies saying, you're not allowed to use open source, it's forbidden. And then they were sort of being uh, disrupted by these other companies who were building software very quickly with really good quality uh, because they were reusing libraries that had been written by other people that are being used around the world. And the idea is that you have many eyes looking at these libraries. So the bugs are shallow, the security problems are shallow, and we have a really good ecosystem where people can use libraries, build software quickly and innovate, but not introduce too many risks. Uh, I'm going to show you that some of those assumptions are not completely accurate, and in fact, a lot of the attacks that are being done today, a lot of the hacker attacks, are actually taking advantage of this growth in open source, because the hackers know that you're using open source as well, and they're using open source, but they have the first mover advantage they can actually exploit a vulnerability much quicker than you as an enterprise can patch. And that gap in time allows them to exploit your systems before you patch them for the vulnerabilities that are inside of them. And, and uh, the other problem too with open source is if you're using a framework like Spring, uh, Spring or, or Struts, uh, two of the more popular Java ones, these websites generate signatures or pages with a signature that can be found using a Google hack. I'm going to show you what the Google hack looks like and how you will get found by a hacker very quickly if you're using one of these frameworks because the signature is very obvious. And what hackers are doing now is instead of actually targeting your specific site, they might do that, they're actually doing broadcast attacks. They're attacking frameworks and they hit 100,000 sites all at once. And if only 1% of them respond and pay the ransomware, they're making a lot of money. So the ROI for these uh, exploits is very high. And the skill level is actually very low. And in fact, you can even get uh, uh, bots from, from, dare I say, from China, where you can actually get a service level from them. They'll actually give you a service release very quickly once the vulnerability is published. They just look at the vulnerabilities that are published. They build an exploit. They send you a, a patch. And now you, the hack has actually got a patch before you do. And they're actually exploiting your site. I'm going to show you sort of some of that cycle. And so the whole idea of DevSecOps I'm going to talk about is helping banks and large organisations reduce your cycle time to what the leading organisations have. So I used to work for MiniGree, it's a big insurance company, the biggest reinsurance company in the world. We released twice a year, and both releases were disasters. And the reason why they were disasters was because it was a big event for us to do a release and we didn't have any practice. And the ops guys would say, give me a run sheet, and they go through the run sheet, something didn't work, they had to go back, and so it was a really, really painful exercise. Whereas the top performing companies like uh, Amazon or, or Google or Facebook, they're releasing 10,000 times a day, releasing. And so they release all the time, and so that allows them to be experimenting and do lots and lots of releases very quickly. And so if they do have a security issue, they're so used to releasing patches, they can actually patch and release very, very quickly. And so banks want to do that as well, so you're not exposed too long. Um, and I'm going to show you actually a hack, and I'll show you the timeline of a, of a hack from last year. And the, the fallout of that hack has been monumental. In fact, the CIO is up on securities fraud charges, and he's potentially going to go to jail because he actually sold shares in his company after he found out about the hack and before he told the market about it, uh, which unfortunately in America is a criminal offence, so shouldn't do that. 
So let me show you what that looks like. And feel free to ask any questions if anything's not clear. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of history lesson here. This is a history of, of Maven. Um, Maven was created around about early 2000s. There's now 9 million um, people committing into Maven uh, uh, every year. So it's a very, very popular uh, repository of open source libraries in the Java world. Uh, we built uh, the central repository and we run that. So Sonotype still runs the central repository. Uh, that number there, 52 billion, actually last year we served 89 billion Java components to developers all around the world. So there's 89 billion downloads of Java libraries. It's, it's ubiquitous. Uh, we have 120,000, now 150,000 installs of Nexus around the world, so it's by far the leading repository manager. And what it does, it basically runs on your premise and acts as a cache for your libraries locally, and it increases the speed and reliability of your builds. It doesn't just do Maven, it also does NPM, Docker, and, and uh, .NET, and, uh, and uh, even C++ and Yum, uh, Red Hat, uh, Ubuntu packages can be proxied through Nexus. So it's really platform independent now. Uh, and also, we have built a security uh, system that allows you to scan your projects for vulnerabilities. And last year, we actually had 19 billion requests for uh, component intelligence. Uh, that was up from 1 billion in 2016. So just a bit about Sonotype. Um, that's our company. We run Nexus. We run Maven Central. Uh, we just got a, a round of funding today, actually, $80 million uh, from TPG, which is one of the world's biggest venture capital firms. Uh, we grow like 78% year on year. We've been pretty successful in this industry, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll share some of that with you. And finally, we have a conference coming up, a free conference, which I'll tell you about. It's a 24-hour conference that you can actually log into. Uh, it'll be running all around the world, and you can download the sessions, and they're going to be recorded. So I'll tell you about that as well. So just quickly about Maven, I'll, I'll, I'll push through this. Um, I think we know Maven. Do you want to do a demo of Maven or are you happy with Maven? Happy, happy. We're all happy with Maven? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll skip that. Uh, this is an interesting graph here. This is the growth of open source. So uh, the purple is uh, Java and Maven. And um, this is 2016, so 2017 is now 89 billion. The, the red one is, is NPM, and what's interesting is it didn't exist basically five years ago, and now it's actually overtaken in Maven in terms of popularity. Well, sort of. The reason being is Java <laughs> script files are very small, and this is a count of every individual package. And so you might have an individual, uh, individual function that's one JavaScript component in NPM. So the count's a lot higher than it is in Java, but nevertheless, it's very popular, and a lot of people around, around the world are using NPM now for building uh, quite big projects. Um, I, I remember when JavaScript came out, and I just can't believe JavaScript has become so popular for being like... Mind boggles. But anyway, what can you do? Um, another interesting fact, 80 to 90% of modern applications consist of assembled components. Is this a surprise for anybody? What this means is that only 10% of your application is actually stuff that you write. 80 to 90% is the framework. So if you're using Spring Boot or Struts, these frameworks are huge. You're downloading gigabytes of code, but you're only going to be writing a few hundred thousand uh, lines of code, possibly. So nowhere near as big as these frameworks. And in JavaScript, in NPM, it's even bigger. So if you're using React, for example, React is a massive JavaScript framework, you might only write a few lines of code, 99% of your code will be the framework, and only 1% will be your custom code. And so what does that mean? Well, it means the bulk of your risk is actually in this open source now, because it's the bulk of your code. But not only that, the hacks and the exploits are well known, and they're published. So this is the reason why uh, people are getting hacked more and more using frameworks, because of this trend. Does that number surprise anybody here? Is that what you would expect, 80 to 90%? Yeah, matches your experience. Uh, I've only been to one bank in Singapore that had one application that was 50 percent. And when I spoke to them about it, they said, "Oh, that's our legacy banking platform that's been around for 15 or 20 years, and they basically wrote it from scratch." That's the only application I've ever seen that was not 80 to 90 percent or 99 percent, in fact. Uh, as I said, not all these components are good. 
Um, this is an interesting statistic. One in five organisations were suspected they'd been breached due to an open source component in the, in the last 12 months. That's a surprise. That's a very high number. And I think a lot of people don't realise how these exploits are done. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you an example of how a hacker is going to find you using uh, a Google hack. I'll show you why this is so easy, this attack vector. I'm going to go into Google here. So in Google, you can actually do things like file type PDF and uh, you know uh, Australia, something like that. This will give you PDF documents about Australia. Great. Well, that is an extension there, PDF. What I can do is I can use that to find struts because struts has, a, has an extension of DO or action. So if I change that, what well, this is going to do, it's going to give me all the websites in the world that have DO in the URL. What that has told me as a hacker, I know a framework that website's built in. I know this is written in struts. So now I can just have a little bot that iterates through these and it comes back with, yes, I can break in or no, I can't. And the big company that was hacked last year was uh, called Equifax. Equifax is a company that does credit checks. Uh, they own Vita Advantage here in Australia, if you've ever heard of that. The reason why this is a big deal in America, every single person will have a file on Equifax. If you apply for a job, they do a credit check. If you apply for a credit card, they do a credit check. Equifax is, a, is the leading company in that industry. And now I hack, and now I hack through the Struts framework. And see this page here, dot action. I know that page is written in Struts as a hacker. I know that. I don't need to do any more heavy lifting. All I need to do now is target the framework because the exploit is known about this particular technology. I know how to break into it. Now, it could be that page has been patched since the vulnerability was published. Could be or could not be. But I'm going to make a guess that if a vulnerability is published on Monday, if I launch my attack on Tuesday, I'm going to be in front of the security and the development team at Equifax they're not going to be patching as quickly as I'm breaking in. So that's, that's the problem. And in fact, that's the actual page that was used by the hackers in the Equifax uh, breach. Now, it's not just Equifax, I know we like to beat up on them, but uh, in India there's a system called um, Adhya, uh, A-A-D-H-A-R-R. Uh, I'm just going to show you an article about that. Uh, here we go, yeah. Any Indians here ever heard of this system? Yeah. It's the ID system in India, compulsory ID system that's being rolled out. Uh, what do you think they've built that system in? It was written in struts. Now this is actually from uh, May of this year. And hopefully you can see that. This is actually a letter Supposed to be secret, so someone took a photo of the journalist actually took a photo of this letter. It's just vulnerability. Right, so that's that's obviously a concern because if you're a person in India and your identification's been stolen, that, that's a major concern. Very hard to regenerate your date of birth and your fingerprints and so on. So this is the problem and and uh, you know probably kept a little bit under wraps, but it is in the, in the press, you can, you can read about this one. Uh, these are not the only organisations. I'll, I'll show you a couple of others. This is, um, this is the San Francisco uh, Municipal Railway. Where are we? Okay. okay, so this one here. So what happened here was uh, the hackers broke into the Muni, the San Francisco railway system, and they didn't use struts in this case. They used another library, very popular, called Commons Collections. Anyone heard of that? <laughs> Everyone used them, right? <laughs> it's a 10-year-old library. Vulnerability was found three years ago, but every single 
organisation I've ever been to in Asia is using the vulnerable version. I think I've only ever seen one company using the new version of the library, even though the, the patch has been around for three years. And what they did is they, it's a remote code execution too, by the way, it has a severity of 9 CVE. So just to put that into context, uh, uh, Heartbleed was a 5. So this is the level 9 CVE that was exploited here. And what they did is they just inserted the ransomware in, and then on the back of that they asked for Bitcoin. And if you think about it, the kill chain is actually anonymous now. In the past, if you stole a credit card, you had to go and sell the credit card, someone had to use the credit card, and the FBI would come and arrest you. So cashing out was a big problem in hacking. Cashing out is a big problem. With Bitcoin, cashing out is anonymous. You have an anonymous wallet. And so what happens is you can have an exploit that's well known, a ransomware that you just download, script kiddies can get those, and then you put a Bitcoin monetization on the back of it. The whole thing's anonymous. Very, very easy to do. Not a lot of skill involved, in fact. I'll show you one that's closer to home. This happened um, in May in, in Sydney. That's a family planning New South Wales site. Their client database was stolen. This is in May 2018. This was not Struts. This is not Java. This was actually PHP. Uh, this one here was actually a thing called Drupal Geddon. Anyone hear of that? Yeah. So Drupal Geddon. Drupal is a content management system written in PHP. And um, basically, what, one of the things they said, which was really interesting, was they said, we were not targeted. We were just caught up in the Drupal vulnerability. So they thought that was a, a positive that they were not targeted. But they thought it might have been politically motivated. They actually didn't pay them out. They actually uh, didn't, didn't respond, in fact. But a journalist reported it because her details were stolen and she was given an email from the hackers. But this is a woman, she's the CEO of that organisation and, and she's obviously very upset because she's in the newspaper for being hacked. She didn't know her programmers had given her this vulnerability and they were just vulnerable. And all that happened was people looked for a signature for PHP and WordPress and uh, Drupal or whatever it is and you know what those signatures are and you break in. That's what's happening today. <coughs> okay, this is another example. This is um, Huawei. So Huawei, big mobile phone company, obviously, they've been banned from selling their equipment into the MBN, they've been banned from selling their equipment into the 5G network. They've also been banned in the UK. And the reason why is because they're not managing their software delivery pipeline. They're not managing their use of third-party libraries. So what's happening is they're downloading open source like everybody else is, but they don't actually have a system to manage it. So they're downloading it, they're not analysing it for vulnerabilities and they're shipping the code. And the UK government realised this and they said, no, that's it, you cannot sell to us anymore. So I was in, I was in Shenzhen last week uh, talking to them actually, because they, they now want to have a product that's going to help them. I'm going to show you a company that got it right. Uh, this is DBS. Uh, this is the CIO of DBS. This is his talk that he gave about executing the digital strategy. Um, DBS is the biggest bank in Southeast Asia. Uh, tens of thousands of programmers, just like any, any bank. Uh, I've got their reference architecture here. It's a modern pipeline that they've done. Um, there's a lot of moving pieces here, but you know it's the usual things. I think it's Nexus, so that, that's why I know about them. Um, they scan for vulnerabilities. They use Ansible and, and Amazon like everyone else does. But the result of what they've done, this is one of their results. Aggressive automation has enabled us to move much faster and increase efficiency. So 100% of automated releases, 10 times increase in automated testing, seven and a half times increase in cadence. So they're actually releasing software more quickly with better quality and better outcomes. And the result has been that they've gone from being last in customer satisfaction in Asia to being the leading bank in Asia in customer satisfaction. And not only that, they actually just won an award for the best digital bank in the world. So that's what they've done. And it's all through DevOps and through DevSecOps initiatives that they've done. And they're pretty excited to be a part of it. They uh, release now, you know, almost daily. 
and they have a, an application, for example, that's uh, distributed into uh, taxis in, in, in Singapore. They have an Android application, so you can actually pay in the taxi. That's part of this pipeline. And so they want to be like a Google. They want to be like an Amazon. Because the problem for banks is that a lot of good developers don't want to join banks, but I think banks are slow and old-fashioned. It's been very hard for banks to attract talent. So banks realise they have to be like a startup. And he basically sees his company as a thousand startups, and uh, it, it's been successful. And this has taken basically only about five years to do this. I'll show you the timeline of the Equifax breach, just to give you an idea of what actually happened. This is the actual things that happened to them last year. March the seventh, the vulnerability was published in Struts. March the ninth. The hackers ran a who am I, so it was two days later. So this is just a pro. On July the 29th, they discovered the breach. So that's a full six months the hackers were in their systems undetected. Now what actually happened was from May until August they were downloading data. So they had actually gotten into the system, worked out what it was doing, and then started uh, the exploit. There's a two-month probe there. Now the crisis management. So they're in the press. Uh, the CEO, the CIO, the CISO all lost their jobs. Uh, as I mentioned, the CIO is on security fraud charges because he sold his shares in July. <laughs> 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 And, and the silly thing is, he, well, the weird thing is, he made four hundred eighty thousand dollars. Imagine how many shares he must have had. Uh, there's a new vulnerability published in September. Okay. Um, now, here's an interesting thing. Because we run Maven Central, we know what people are downloading. After that, after the vulnerability was published, forty-six thousand organisations downloaded the vulnerable version. Even though there was a patch release, they still downloaded the vulnerable version. 3,000 downloaded the exact version that, 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 that Equifax were using. Now, uh, some of these companies, the Canadian Revenue Service, uh, the GMO, the Japan Post, uh, Okinawa Electricity. So, infrastructure is another thing that people are hacking. Okay. Uh, question. I can't hear, sorry. Sorry. Uh, what you're saying is fascinating, right? Um, but where's the duty of care for Sonata, right? So you know that there's a vulnerable version, yep. and you know that millions of people are downloading it, yep. but you let them. We let them. Right. Why not cut it off yep. and say, until you say to us that you'll accept the risk, you cannot download it? Great, great question. Why great not question. stop that, right? Yes. to me, you have a duty of care. Right, right. Okay. But you're happy to let millions of people download the vulnerability yep. that you know about. Yeah, right. Now, I'm not personally, right? Yeah, sure, you come sure. and go, you know about it. Yeah. Why let it happen? Yeah, yeah, good question. Good question. So the question is, why does SoSlap allow people to download a vulnerable version of this library? Any, anyone got any ideas why we might do that? Because people rely on it to build their buggy software. Yeah. Without them. Again, there's, there's this difference between we're going to crash it, yeah. right? You've gone to get it. And when you fail your build or your download, yep. saying there is a vulnerability in this, you need to be aware. Yep. Right? Then yep. at least they're looking at some logs and seeing that they're downloading the version. Yeah. Then let them make the request. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. No, good question. Good good point. So yeah, I get that question a lot. Literally all around the world, people say, why do you allow this to happen? Right. But your answer is the answer, sorry. I thought someone said. Yes, yeah, so the answer is. If we actually stop people across the world, we, we blocked it. Because this library is actually not malicious. It's not deliberately being injected as a vulnerability. It's not a, a hack as such. It's just an error or a mistake. And, and this is something that we, we're asked a lot, and we, we do sort of have, have discussions. People say, why don't you block it? The answer is that different organisations have different risk appetites. And at what level do you block it? Do you block it when it's a level 1 CVE or a level 10 CVE? Do you block it based on, uh, yeah, so is there a Maven repo I can go to where I can set that flag? Yes. So yes, there's the public one, all risk, no responsibility, and then there's one where I say my build will fail, 
because you're happy. <coughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I'd pay money for that. Yeah, that's and a great question. If I question. Could tell you got a free thing, yeah. I would pay you money yeah. to so say, the I will fail if there's well, a vulnerability. Thank you, sir. I cannot download it if you've identified a vulnerability. Yeah, cannot do yeah, exactly. So yes, and the answer is yes, and I'm going to show you that. I'm going to show you that. So the question is, can some type block it if you want? If your risk appetite is such, you're not going to like that. And the answer is yes, and I'll show you how we do that. One final thing about the exploit. This is the time it takes to exploit. Uh, in 2006, the average exploit happened in 45 days, on average. It's come down to 15 days by 2015. Uh, Equifax was two days. It took two days for Equifax to be breached. Uh, I was at a security conference and some guys were talking about AWS. Uh, if you put your AWS credentials on the internet, on, on GitHub or Pastebin, how long is it before you're uh, breached? Anyone know what the time is? An hour. hour. Yeah, it's 30 minutes. It's 30 minutes. And we were all shocked. So that basically means if you put your credentials on the internet for AWS, someone will harvest those within 30 minutes. Uh, now what's interesting is Amazon, <laughs> being a big company, actually has a team of people that respond to these and they will contact you and say, by the way, we found your credentials on GitHub, don't do that, <laughs> take it <them> off. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so that's, um, that's, that's the nature of the world. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to, to do some of this and how to block it. So, uh, I think your, your question is a great segue into that. Uh, let's just have a look here. Okay, I'm just going to show you that. So, is that coming up? Okay, that's great. Okay. So here's our friend Commons Collections. Right. So what I'm seeing here you know, I'm seeing a list of all of the components in my release. So these are these are ranked by vulnerability score. The, the, the ones that you can see clearly, the black ones are direct dependencies in your POM. The grey ones are transitive dependencies. These are libraries that are brought in as part of the, the dependency tree. Uh, there's some here that are transitive that have vulnerabilities and some are direct ones that have vulnerabilities. I've got struts 2 in here as well. Uh, this is a bunch of libraries that, that people have used around the world that have asked me to investigate for them. But if you have a look at Commons Collections, what we're seeing here is the group artifact conversion, which is the identification. We have the license as well, because licensing could be a risk. If you're a telco and you're distributing GPL software onto your set-top boxes, that's actually a breach of the license. Uh, you're not supposed to use AGPL for commercial purposes. A lot of people aren't aware of these things. Um, it's 10 years old. Uh, this exact match, I can talk to you about that. Basically, it means the hashes match. The library that you're using is the hash that we have in Sonotype. So we have a hashing algorithm so that we can guarantee the provenance of the component. Hasn't been intercepted by somebody and a man in the middle has, has done some modification of it. This here is actually the history of Commons collections. So here are older versions. Here are newer versions. And this is the popularity. So this is telling you because we run Maven Central, we know how popular these libraries are. We know how many people are downloading these on a daily basis. Um, unfortunately, everyone has this version that's 10 years old, and there's a vulnerability. There's actually someone has, has found it, has, has found an issue in it. And I can see the details here. Um, it's a level nine uh, arbitrary remote code execution. Uh, there's a class there called Invoker Transformer that's vulnerable. There's a blog there about it. Basically allows people to hack you using uh, deserialization. But if you see here, there's actually a fix. See this version here? It's been remediated. The vulnerability is gone now. It's been patched. And that version there is 3.22. The one that you've got is 3.21. You see there 3.21. But if I go to the right, I've got 3.22. So what I can do as a programmer is I can fix it. I can fix the vulnerability on day one. So this is the idea of shifting left and, and shifting security information to the developers so they can fix it immediately. Question. Is, can we have that as part of the build process? Like yes. Plugin? Yeah, there's a plugin for the build process. Where you give the flag at level 9 or level 8 and stop it? Yeah. 
I'll show you that. Yeah, so the question is, can we actually get this as part of the build process? And if it's a level A when I stop the build, absolutely, and I'll show you that. So what I can do here is I can actually pick 3.22, and I can hit this migrate button, and the migrate button there will actually edit my POM for me, and then I hit finish, and save that, and it, as it's going to finish rebuilding, it's off the list. It's down the bottom here with all the blue, all the nice open source. You see down the bottom here, I've got all these blue ones. These are all good. No known vulnerabilities in these blue ones. This is the good open source that you want. So the idea is that you fix it. When you inject the vulnerability, when you inject the bug, fix the bug on the spot. Don't wait for a security audit or a VAPT or, or worse in the newspaper. Fix it when you see it. Because whilst this is uh, current, you can fix it much more easily. I'll show you, this is struts. Now, interestingly about struts, this is three years ago, this version was found to be vulnerable. Uh, it was published over, the, it was found vulnerable afterwards. If I look at the details here, there's lots and lots of CVEs. There's literally a dozen of them. And not only that, there's lots and lots of versions as well. If I show you all the versions, there's a version, these are all versions here. This version here is 22 days old. So if you're using that framework, do you know that this version has actually been released 22 days ago that fixes the vulnerabilities in your release? Maybe, maybe not. And you might know Struts and you might know Spring or whatever because it's front of mind, but what about the other 100 dependencies that you've got in your project? Are you aware of the vulnerabilities in them? It's almost impossible to do this by hand. It's impossible almost. And I have one customer, he's spent three months analysing all this by hand before he, he got asked in, and then as soon as he finished it, start again, because he didn't know there'd been any zero days. So he eventually spent his whole life tracking these things down. He was the lead developer, and he, he said, oh, I hated my life. <laughs> and because it's, it's a nightmare, and you don't know, and you're just one person, we have 150,000 customers, we get a lot of feedback from them about this. You just can't match the scale of what we can do in terms of this information. And we have our own research team and, and lots of other technologies as well. So you're asking about how to actually do the builds and how to integrate with the builds. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. So I've got Jenkins here. And I've got some Jenkins builds. And what our plugin does is it allows you to actually do an evaluation as part of the build. So this is... Um, definition of a build here in Jenkins. And we have a plugin that creates a step here that does the evaluation. So there's a step here that you can add, which is the Nexus policy evaluation. Answer your question. Sorry. Well, that's something I guess. Is there a feature I mean, it's been a while since I've used Maven, but it, I've always found that when you specify a POM, oh, sorry, a, a library you're depending on, you have to give it the full version. Yeah. Right? Whereas other package managers say, as long as it's compatible with the major version, yeah. just level it up. Yeah. Yeah. So if that was there, then things like there is a release 22 days ago yeah. would just be the next build. Yeah. So is that a feature of Maven? And if not, when would it be? Yeah, there are some plugins that do that in Maven. Basically, yeah. yeah. all the version, like many more this. Yeah. 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 So the question is auto, push it up. But again, that's about your risk appetite as well, because you now got quality risk. But yes, there is tools that do that. And so what happens is when you do this evaluation, you can evaluate this application against a set of policy rules that determine your risk appetite for vulnerabilities. So if I show you, I've got my, my build monitor here. I'm going to simulate a bunch of builds at different stages of the software development lifecycle based on our risk appetite. So what I'll show you is I'll show you how to set that up. So imagine we have your scenario, don't allow severity seven vulnerabilities in. What I can do is I can say something like this. Give it any threat level you want. I'm going to check for security problems. 
There's other things we can check for as well, like the age. You can even check the coordinates. You can ban a library if you want. You don't want a particular library, you can say that. It's going to show you severity score here. Here's your risk appetite. So what you can do is you can actually interact with the builds. The proxy is to download, which is your question. I'll show you that as well. You can actually block it from even being downloaded. Um, you can do it in the IDE, you can do it in the build servers. So what you can do is you can say something like this. This is a common scenario. You might warn developers, but not fail the build. But you can fail a release. We will not allow an automatic deployment of a known vulnerable library. And then you can get a notification. I can send this to myself, or I can send it to a distribution group or a role. You can even create a Jira ticket. So the idea is you can put it into the backlog, gets added in as a bug or whatever into your build pipeline. So the idea here is to be notified get people about it. And the continuous monitoring, what that is, is continuous monitoring will look for zero days. So if there's a vulnerability published after you've released, it will tell you about it. So you're not actually uh, writing the software anymore, it's just sitting there running, but you want to know about it. You want to know that you're vulnerable now to a new exploit. That's what the continuous monitoring will do. Is there any scanning of the code, Sorry, or is it only known vulnerabilities? So the question again, sorry? Is it only known vulner vulnerabilities, or is there any scanning of the code involved too? No. So the question is, is it only known vulnerabilities? Yeah, we only look at the open source. There's other tools that look at the code, yeah. uh, like Fortify or whatever. A lot of those tools are, are prone to a lot of false positives, mm -hmm. and so typical, people typically don't put those into their build pipeline. Uh, we don't have a big issue with uh, false positives because we use this hashing algorithm and the libraries are known, and the vulnerabilities are known. And it's the bulk of your risk now as well, and, and it was sort of uh, something that a lot of people weren't addressing as well as open source. So I've got my little rule there. I'm going to trigger some builds here in um, Jenkins. And I've got my build monitor. So we've got our big screen in the, in the build hall, and what's going to happen in a few seconds is it's going to start failing. And to answer your question, we, we fail the build based on the policy. And then uh, I'm actually going to do a firewall as well. I'll show you what happens when someone tries to download a, a vulnerable library and it will fail in the repo. So <clears throat> let's just uh, give it a second. Did you say that policy in Nexus? Or Sorry, I'm not going to hear the policy. Come on. What's the question? Did you say the policy in Nexus? Or in the policy? in this particular instance. So if I have a look at this particular workspace here, it's actually analysing that wall that was built there. So even if you're using Nexus, this is independent of the Nexus repo. This works with Artifact or any repo. It doesn't require the Nexus repo. All of this is just working with that build pipeline. So any build tool that you use, whether it's Bamboo or Jenkins or whatever, will generate a build artifact and then we'll analyse it. <clears throat> okay. That's happened. So while we're just talking, it's actually done all those builds. The scan's very quick. It only takes a few seconds to do each scan. Yeah. And this is over the light light here. So 30 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute, 51 seconds. Now if I have a look at this one here that failed, every, every build gets a, a report associated with it. You also get your console output. I'm actually looking, these are all the things that are in the build that are analysed. Here's the policy. The policy we created, this is our risk appetite demo for JVM. These, these libraries here are all known vulnerable libraries. I'm just going to go through here. Here's the build report. <coughs> so, what it's telling you here is I've got 41 critical and 44 severe vulnerabilities, known issues in this particular release. This is WebGoat, um, this well-known uh, application. Put this dependency tree here, so it's telling you that level one, you've got vulnerabilities, but in the dependency tree, you've got vulnerabilities as well. 
Right another question. Yeah. Yeah, another question. I'm sorry, as it's doing that scan, how much information is this sent to Sonify to go out and build? And um, you know, what mechanism is used for transporting that information? So I'm from a corporate background, and yeah. typically internet access is restricted, and that's one of the good things about using a server like Nexus is that all of the payment artifacts go through that. Yeah. And the Nexus server tends to have special access to the internet. To do yeah. That. Um, but this build thing is also sending information off to Sonatype. Yeah. So the question is, what's sent to Sonatype? So the architecture is that uh, on premise you have this IQ server. This is the IQ server. This is running locally on my machine. The plugin in Jenkins takes a hash of all the components. Those jars that are there, there was a hash taken of those. It's just a SHA-1 hash. We don't the source code. The source code never leaves your premises. Those SHA-1 hashes are then taken from the IQ server and sent to our knowledge base uh, server at Sonify. And this knowledge base server sends back the metadata about those SHA-1 hashes. So the only, the only thing that happened, I can show you the payload, is a SHA-1 hash of all the dependencies. So I'll, I'll, show, you, I'll show you that now, actually. So that's, that's another very common question. If I have a look inside of the application. So there's a scan there. And um, I'm just going to um, unzip that. This is one from 749 that just happened a few minutes ago. So this is, this is the payload here. This is the application web code that's showing up here. See the SHA-1 hash is just the SHA-1 of the binary. Yeah. So the first thing you can get is you can get this view here. This is actually a bill of materials. This is the demo for JVM policy here. This is all the components, the 90 components that are in the release. So we actually tell you the component we found we tell you how popular it is because we have the, the data at, at Maven. Um, how old is it? This is the history of that particular project that you're using. So you can see straight away there's newer versions of these libraries. Um, and if I click on Commons Collections, for example, that same information the developer has, you have here in the management dashboard. But you can actually click on the vulnerability here and read up on it. This is done by our research team. So we have 75 full-time researchers that enhance the data. So it's not just public data. And in fact, 97% of our vulnerabilities are found by our researchers in our automated tooling. And I can give you some examples of that. Because what we do with these jars, we actually open them up and look at the classes in it. And then we look across the whole of Maven Central for that same class. When someone reused it, then we implicate that other component. Even if it's not published in the CVE, we will implicate it and tell you about it. And not only that, sometimes the CVEs are hard to understand. So we actually give you this sort of developer-friendly explanation. Uh, interestingly, there was a CVE published later on. In fact, the developers of this project said it wasn't vulnerable. And for 80-something days, 83 days, we actually had the vulnerability. There was no public CVE. And that's, that's another advantage of using a tool. And then finally, we have this recommendation here. So we actually tell you what to do. So we say, okay, upgrade to that 3.2.2 version. But there is actually a potential workaround. If you can't upgrade, we'll tell you there's a workaround. There's something you can do if it's too hard for you to upgrade the library. And then we have these articles here that we researched to find out about it. This is actually the, the researcher who found it. And he wrote this blog about it. All these systems use Commons Collections, JBoss, Jenkins. Um, and you can read up about how that exploit works. So uh, that's the view there. You get the security view of all the security vulnerabilities. Uh, you get this uh, listing of all the licensing issues as well, if licensing is important to you. And then not only that, all of this comes back to the dashboard. So these are all the scans that I've done recently. And these are the most recent vulnerabilities. And then finally, we actually have uh, this component view. So this one here answers the question, oh, um, we're using struts. I just said it's vulnerable. Which applications are using it? Or which ones are using Commons Collections? You can just click on this hyperlink here and see all the applications that are using that component. So I'm just mindful of the time. It's almost top of the hour. Do you normally go through to about eight? 
Okay, so I'm happy to show you more. I'm happy to show you uh, the Nexus repo and the firewall if you want to see how that works. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So I'll show you, I'll show you the Nexus repo, and this is how you can block it at the repository. So this is when you're trying to proxy components into your local Maven. Is it a paid platform or is it all just um, is that the IQ server and scanning and that sort of stuff? Is it a paid platform? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, the question is the IQ server you have to pay for. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's not open source, that's a commercial product. Um, it's basically we, we license it per developer. Um, plugin for Nexus, and this is actually going to give you that policy uh, viewpoint of your repo. And uh, I've got lots of different uh, repos here, not just Maven, I've got JavaScript, like NPM stuff here as well, and, and JCenter and Google, uh, uh, JDK, and, and all the different stuff. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, um, this is the health check of your repo, this is telling you all the components in your repo and, and they're vulnerable. But what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to block a download. I'm going to attempt to download something. So I'm going to fail it here at the proxy. And then I've got a um, build here in my uh, clips. And what's going to happen is it's actually going to be blocked from downloading uh, a vulnerable version of uh, that component. Too long. That might be the one you upgraded before. Same question. That could be the one that you upgraded the library in before. You said so. It could be the one you upgraded the library. Oh, that's before. true. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good point. Let's do it here in Jenkins. Let's go back. So we have a look in our repo and we refresh it. What's actually going to happen is it's actually going to tell me in 
here that it blocks something. There it is. Block the firewall. Have a look at that. Okay. Been quarantined. Not allowed to be downloaded because it's vulnerable. So there you go. That's how the firewall works. And you can actually uh, then have a look at that. And um, one of our customers in the US, they were doing Python stuff, and developers were blocked. They tried to download a library. And the firewall blocked them, and they complained to the security officer and said, oh, you have to release it, we need this library. <laughs> and they investigated it and said, well, yeah, it is vulnerable. And then they said, well, can you fix it? And the guy said, yeah, the fix is really easy. So what they did is they actually went into the open source community, fixed the vulnerability, issued a pull request that was approved and put it into the core, and then they were able to download the new version. So it's actually good use of open source. It's actually rather than just living with it, fix it. And... Uh, yeah, so that's a very quick run through. Happy to answer, answer any more questions. It's just past eight o'clock. I don't want to hold you up too long. We've got family and Danny's been you at the bar. <laughs> I just wonder if there is there any uh, dark image? Dark image? Dark image? Dark image? Dark image? Do you want to see the Docker image? So, Docker? Sure. So, what do you want to see about Docker? You want to see the scanning of Docker or to see the proxying of Docker? So, so Docker can be proxied through the repo. Um, so it's probably take a bit too long to set it up, but I can show you what I've got. So this is some Docker images. These have been proxied through the repo. Uh, Docker, uh, the Docker client understands the repo. And when you do Docker, basically you have to set up a proxy for Docker. Uh, like this. Basically, you just tell it, just like you do with Maven, you just tell it you're going to be proxying the Docker Hub. And then what happens is you create an endpoint, just like you do with Maven. And so this endpoint becomes your new Docker registry for your uh, third party components. And when you download a Docker image, it'll come through Nexus repo. Once you've done that, what you can then do you can analyze the vulnerabilities. So I've actually got a Docker project here. And if I have a look at that build here, so it's basically uh, pulling all the Docker layers down, building the image, and then when that finishes, it there's lots of stuff in there. You get this build report, just like you did with the Maven project. And this will give you a health check of your Docker image. Uh, this is actually Jenkins. This is actually the Jenkins image here. Jenkins uses open source. Jenkins is full of vulnerabilities as well. Um, <laughs> don't expose your Jenkins to the internet. Um, some people injected some crypto miners into Jenkins instances um, early this year. They harvested about $3.4 million of compute time of Jenkins instances around the world. Um, these are the security issues inside of it. Uh, what are they using? I think they're other things. Okay, so there's Bouncy Castle. Bouncy Castle is a really famous library doing that for a long time. Uh, it's an encryption library. Is it vulnerable? Sorry? Is it vulnerable? I haven't really finished. Is that, sorry, sorry, is that library, Bouncy Castle, is yeah. it vulnerable? It's vulnerable, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> about Bouncy Castle is um, you're taught at university, others don't write your own encryption algorithm, right? So no, no, because it's not checked. So everyone uses Bouncy Castle, but if you're using it, you're vulnerable to exploit. There's actually a new version. You just have to make sure you upgrade to this non-vulnerable version. <laughs> yeah. And, and the problem is these components go bad over time because as more people look at it, they discover the vulnerabilities. So you have to always try and, and be on this faster release cycle. Any other questions? The Docker thing that you showed just now, can that that be done locally as well? Can I do the same thing when I'm building my Docker? Yes, yes, exactly. So if you're building your Docker, the question is can I do that locally? And can I scan it? Yes, the answer is yes. So basically, all that you have to do to get it to work with Docker is 
at, at a step, I've actually got a little pipeline here. So if I show you the definition of my job, what I've done <coughs> is I've just got a typical uh, Jenkins pipeline. And in this particular instance here, I'm doing a Docker save, and then I'm doing the Nexus here. This is the step in my build pipeline, and that will scan your image. And you just basically tell it that you just need to scan it, uh, basically tell it uh, to, to go and find the tar file that gets created as part of the Docker process, and uh, it'll scan your local like, Docker images. Sorry. Uh, two questions. One is, I assume basically it's shown us the Docker yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Does it work with NPM? Yeah, absolutely. So if if I've got an NPM project, I've got one called Juice Shop. So uh, the question is NPM. I'm going to show you a project here called Juice Shop. Is anyone familiar with Juice Shop? Have you heard of this? Juice Shop is a deliberately vulnerable NPM application <laughs> for, for training purposes. Um, it's actually really, really good. Um, here it is. It's actually now part of OWASP. OWASP is the Open Web Application Security Project. It's, this is an intentionally vulnerable JavaScript application. It's got things like capture the flag, and you can do this for brown bag launches, teaching people about secure coding practices, SQL injection attacks, and, and, and everything else in between. So what that looks like, when you evaluate that, it looks like this. Um, JavaScript has got 10,000 components in it. JavaScript's very good OWASP. So there has massive numbers of libraries. And any sort of basic project will have a massive tree as well. So if I show you here, okay, here's my brow, okay. So this particular library here, it's another Sonnet type one that we found. And the reason being is because in JavaScript, they're cowboys. What happens is they don't create CVEs. This is a real project, very popular, it's a real vulnerability. And what happened was when they found out about it, all they did was they just fixed it in GitHub, committed the fix and moved on. They never told anybody about it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so we, we built a system to ingest JavaScript uh, and, and, and Jenkins projects, oh, not Jenkins, sorry, um, GitHub projects because of this. We actually have a look at the security issues. Almost all of them have sonotype codes. I think there's only a few here that have CVEs, yeah. So there's like two there with published CVEs. The rest of them are all proprietary data that we found in our research. So another question for you then is, do you report those as CVEs once you've found them? Yeah, that's a good question. Do we report them? Well, the project team actually knows about the vulnerability. They fixed it. So who, what do we report? You fixed your vulnerability. It's so their responsibility to raise a CVE. So the project team's responsibility to create CVEs. If we do find a vulnerability in code when we inspect it that has not been published, there's nothing about it, we will tell the project team and say, look, we found this vulnerability in your code, um, you know, should go and fix it. So yes, we do that. Is, um, oh, yeah. Is there any general st 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 uh, stats about when you have installed IQ server, what, like, what percentage of libraries are on average vulnerable? Yep, that, what percentage are vulnerable? Um, it varies by ecosystem. It's about one in 16, I think, at the moment. But in terms of projects, like how many projects are vulnerable, I think, the, I think the number that I've read somewhere is like 70 to 80% of projects that are scanned are actually vulnerable. They use one of these vulnerable libraries. The actual number of vulnerabilities is about 6 to 7%. I'll just get that up for you. I've got the statistics. Yeah. Was there another question over here? Uh, my, my question is, uh, how do you know uh, this vulnerable uh, uh, for the for the package or the JAR file or or a file? It is just from the uh, the developed from the uh, the one file or just JAR file, or uh, you will have some methodology to detect the, for example, for uh, for some. Uh, some cat or some uh, course database, they have different settings. If you use the default settings, it might be vulnerable for, for the production one or yeah. something. So uh, what, I'm, what I'm interested in is, what's the methodology behind it? Got it. So what's the methodology behind saying something vulnerable? So 
the, the answer is that, for example, you're talking about configuration there. So you might configure Tomcat and therefore it's no longer vulnerable. That answers the question from the beginning is why don't we just block it? The answer is you could actually have a vulnerable component, but if you configure it correctly, it's no longer vulnerable. So you know how to configure it. We're going to tell you that's vulnerable, but we don't know how you configure it. Configuration will be done as a separate thing. We're actually going to scan it, identify the component, take the hash value of it, and match that hash back to our hashes that we have at Sonatype. And then we know that it's actually got a published vulnerability. But you can make a decision as an informed adult about what you do with that. If you use it or if you're going to configure your way around it, that's your responsibility. We're just going to tell you that it's vulnerable and you now can make a decision about it. We will report that it as vulnerable. But the policy engine allows you to say not applicable. So what you can say is it's not applicable for us because we've actually configured it so that it's no longer vulnerable. But you need to do that. We're just going to report it to you. First, look to find that statistics about the number of vulnerabilities. I think I have it here in the, in the slide there. Yeah. So this is this is um, this is some JavaScript examples. 87% of handlebars, 37% of jQuery, 40% of Angular. One example. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Okay, so I uh, thank you and. Uh, to uh, come and do your demo or speak to your team if you want to do that. Happy to do a POC as well. That's a free POC. You can actually see if it works for you. So if you want to be interested in that, happy to do that. So given the topic of the discussion, it reminded us of something. Who was running this? I forgot the name. Uh, a guy called Jen Zeitrich. He did a talk at Melk JVM about 2013, 2014 about dependency, dependencies and minor major versions and how you upgrade your plugins. So I, I strongly advise you all to fill out the survey. So it's run by a university and it asks you questions about how you manage your dependencies. Um, a lot of the things we've heard tonight have had people asking questions about what versions they select, how they select them. So, you know, contribute to the scientific community and find out how badly we're managing dependencies or how well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now we'll leave Cameron for this. Come back down here. No, no one has scanned this project, thankfully. <laughs> 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 Thank you all for attending and we shall see you next month.